Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Martha Ryan, founder and executive director of the Homeless Prenatal Program. Martha has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Martha, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Homelessness, prenatal care, so important and such a challenging environment in which to provide prenatal care. Talk about the genesis of this concept that it, you turn into a program and into services that are directly provided to people in need. Sure. Well, it goes way back to 1989. In 1989, families were the fastest growing subset of the homeless population. And I am a family nurse practitioner, and I was working in a clinic. And one of my mentors um, at the time was medical director for health care for the homeless. And he told me that there were women who were pregnant and not getting any care. And as a nurse practitioner, I, I knew that prenatal care was essential. And I knew it would help to have uh, help women deliver healthy babies. And I also knew that it was a time where a woman could turn her life around. So first of all, I was in disbelief that there would be women who would be homeless and pregnant at the same time. So I went out and had a look. And the night that I went out there, there were three women at different stages of their pregnancy. Not one was getting care. I, at the time, was getting my master's in public health at Berkeley. So I said that I would go out and I'd volunteer one night a week and uh, link women up to care. And I did that. Um, but as I did that, uh, the problem got worse and worse. And, and you were educating yourself on the inadequacies of the response of the system. Exactly. I would talk to people about it. I would say something has to be done. It's getting worse. And everybody nods and everybody says yes. And It's awful, they would say. And then I thought, well, I can't be a volunteer the rest of my life. And so I took a grant writing class. I wrote a grant uh, that described the work that I was doing one night a week. And I submitted it to the San Francisco Foundation. And it landed on the desk of this woman who was a, a the uh, grants manager, and she called me a week later, and she said, I want to meet you. And it was, a, it was about a year later. This was actually in 1988. And in 1989, in November, I got my first grant, which was for $52,000. And that funded three part-time people. I was one of them. I always like to say nobody gets rich doing this work. <laughs> but um, and, and the rest is history. I really hadn't planned on doing this work. Uh, Previously, I had been working in refugee camps in Eastern Africa. And I really was getting my master's in public health to go back and to Eastern Africa or some other uh, developing part of the world to set up maternal and child health programs. When I found it right here in San Francisco. One of the things that you learn when you work on the street is that, it, is that there are a thousand stories. And once you've heard every story you can hear, there are a thousand more stories. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that you are taking the individual's needs into account, but also organizing a service that needs to be repeatable and cannot be so expansive as to yourself meet all of their needs? You partner with others who do the work better than you do. So you have to know the landscape first. You have to know the landscape. And I didn't know it immediately. And I did try to meet everybody's needs. And the staff that I worked with also tried to meet everybody's needs. But as the years went on, and I've been doing this almost for three decades, I, uh, I realized this problem is so huge, so difficult, that you cannot, nobody can do it on the, uh, by themselves. And you have to partner with others. And so that's what we've, we've been doing. And we've evolved into a program that provides a suite of services, but also has a suite of partners, if you will, uh, who work with us. And you need that engagement with others to be able to make the transfer from you to another partner. And very often, people seek battles that they can win. This is a battle that you can't really win. It's a battle of small victories. It's a never-ending struggle. How do you gain the energy, this, the psychic energy, to, to dedicate your life to a struggle to which there is no ultimate solution. I suppose those little successes along the way are what keep me going. And um, so in the first of the three that uh, the initial grant funded, one was a former client. And I modeled this work uh, that I'm doing today on work I'd done in Eastern Africa, where we trained women in the camps to be the link 
to the people we were there to serve. And these were women who uh, had the lowest place in society and was based solely on their gender. And yet they rose, and they became leaders, and they did an, an incredible job. And in 1985, in the Sudan, we had four epidemics in six months. We controlled them, not because of Western medicine, but because of these women. So more than half of my staff today, and we have a staff of 80, uh, has been a client or has lived the life experience of the client. And so we invest in that community, our community, and they do the work. And they are the ones who told me what to do, uh, what services families would need. I didn't know what homeless families would need. Right. I think the greatest, thing, best thing that I ever did uh, <clears throat> in the last 27 years was listen. Listen to those who really had the answers. And then talk to others. So you've also shaped your services in consultation with the community. The community, in essence, is telling you what that community needs. Let's talk about the services. Let's talk about the work. Starting off with finding people who need your services. How do you do that? How do you, do people come to you? Do you evangelize and reach out into the community? How does that work? Um, we, people do come to us. We don't have to evangelize anymore. We did in the very beginning. When I started, I started in a closet in a shelter. And um, so I was there where they lived. And literally? Literally. A closet in the uh, shelter. It was a closet in a shelter. And I shared it with Health Care for the Homeless. So it was a pretty crowded space. And um, I used to fill it up with donations and would get mad at me. But I always knew I'd have somebody to be able to give the clothing to or the shoes to or whatever it was that people were donating. And um, so I went to them in the beginning. And I created, when you go to people, you create a trust that's different. When you have people who are like the people you are serving, they create the trust. And so we have this community health worker training program. And we train formerly homeless mothers to be health workers and to be outreach workers. And they, in the beginning, would go out into the community with jackets on, with homeless prenatal printed on the, on the back of it, and talk to people and, and approach women on the street who were pregnant ask if they were getting care, ask if they had any needs. And, um, but now the word is out. What people often don't realize is that the techniques that you're talking about are the same techniques that one would use in the Sudan. Would you, when, when one is talking about um, reducing vectors of transmission for malaria mm -hmm. and training women in particular environments to go and evangelize for uh, care and different types of behavior and, um, and creating a cadre of service providers who themselves are affected. That is essentially what you did. That's, that experience that you had in Africa really stood you in good stead. That's exactly right. And so often we go to countries and we, tell, we, we take our Western work to them. And here is an instance where they, what I learned from them and the work that they were doing um, we started it by, by training the women, but, but how it worked. And, how, and, and seeing that it worked so well over there that I realized, why would someone listen to me here in America? A woman who had never been homeless before, who hadn't been a drug addict, who hadn't experienced the same things that the families that I was re uh, there to serve were experiencing. But wouldn't they, uh, ex wouldn't they trust somebody who had been through it? and who had successfully overcome those issues. And she would become a role model. And it would be a stepping stone for her to go on further in life. So you break a cycle, and I've seen the cycle get broken. Being able to provide some sort of a continuum of care where your data is useful to somebody else mm -hmm. who will also be serving this, this family, of course with the assent of the family itself, is so important. So important. Absolutely, yeah. That you really do have to communicate. In fact, I like to tell my staff we have to over-communicate about the, the needs and what the client has done. And, but you don't want the client to have to keep communicating his or her needs. In fact, we have a, a collaboration with uh, three other partners here in the city on housing where we share the same database. So if a family comes to us and they need to find housing and we have a little bit of money that we can help them with the down payment, uh, but we can't pay the whole thing. We just send the application to the other three partners. It's Hamilton, 
Catholic Charities and Couples Community Services, and we cobble together. We work together. The family tells the story once. They don't have to repeat it to everybody, and it, it, it works. A wonderful story, a never-ending struggle, great personal victories. Martha Ryan, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Homeless Prenatal Program with us, and thank you so much for your insight. Thank you very much. <laughs>